Yeah, good morning, everyone. It's nice to, uh, here we are in day two. For those of you who missed the welcomes, uh, I'm welcoming you again. Uh, and in particular, I'm welcoming Matt Smith, um, who's coming to us from Portsmouth. And um, uh, I understand that he's, he's going to be largely uh, missing in a, in, from the screen, and instead we're going to be seeing uh, a beautiful object in action. So, uh, Matt, welcome. I'm going to leave you to the stage. Um, and we'll see you on the other end, as they say. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you very much for the organisers for inviting me and um, being part of this um, fantastic event. Um, I'm incredibly impressed by everybody who's presenting. Um, so in this presentation, I will, in a moment, shift uh, modes and um, hand over to the star of the show, which is the, the objects. Um, so and and then I will come back to me and then I will talk and hopefully I will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Um, I hope uh, you enjoy this presentation. It's called Talking to a Malformed Root and Expanding Foam, Speculative Sentience in Performing Objects. Tangled, heave, rhizosphere, adventitious, flare, girdling, unstoppable, gall, morphogenesis, mitosis, neoplasmic, tumorous, Hypertrophies, dysfunctional, bulbs, decentered, tubers, multiplicity, in between, into being, intermezzo, deterritorialize, assemblages. Flows, strata, molar, nomad, observe, fecundity, unbounded, animacy, bridges, haptic, absurd, ludic, flattening, meta object. You resist my attempts to define you. You contradict knowledge formed about you. You confound my attempts to rationalize your existence. You laugh at my meager language that confuses the experience of you. You sit there stock still, knowing I do not fully understand you. Looking at you, I begin to understand what it is to be human, though I will never understand what it feels like to be a root. Your otherness is uncanny and playful. I welcome you to the future. You sit there stock still. I do not fully understand you. You are material and you are metaphor. My gaze animates you. You are given the appearance of an autonomous object. Try and make this process work with a human being and not a root and it is impossible. 
my active gaze animates your presence and you seemingly come to life. You remind me of how complicated it is to relate to each other. You are an enigmatic problem for me to solve. You welcome me through your body without organs, tainted by the polluted air, concrete, and my hands. Are you a false idol? Are you a dysfunctional root heaving between architecture? Are you an adventitious root transformed through stress? Are you a gall born from the intersection or the interactions of insects? I am not trying to know you. I look at you and then look away. I do not want to remake you in my image. I do not want to penetrate your surface. This is not, or is it not, or is it about desire? Neurobiologists describe you as the brain of the plant, observing and navigating. Your form can be mutated through human husbandry or plant shaping. I found the route on the street and it spoke to me and it said, take me home with you as I am lost and I do not want to be left and discarded anymore. Well, that's what I thought it said when I heard it in my head. I picked you up and I took you home in my bicycle's basket. The route weighed heavier than I imagined and it sat in my kitchen until all its bugs started to vac vacate. So you then lay in the garden, protecting the tortoise from escape. You came from Summerstown, an urban area of Portsmouth, near the fire station and the mosque. Lacrimae rerum. Lacrimae rerum. Lacrimae. Lacrimae rerum. The tears of things, object, abject, abject, object, I, object, I, object. Expanding foam. Aline Wiam valorizes performing objects based on her reading of Deleuze and how she concludes that autonom automata and marionettes are not only mere dark faces of a lost humanity, they mainly are interventions to create and compose new possibilities of being, sensing, thinking and resisting in a world made of human and non-human elements which constantly mix. In relation to my practice, this opening up of the possibilities of being is part of the relationship to the vibrant ecology of objects. Polyurethane, isocyanates, polyols, amine catalysts, tack free, methylene. Diphenyl diocyanate asthma amine catalysts halos ethylene glycol hexa bromo decane tris phosphate Halogenated compounds, synthetic, bioaccumulative, thermal resistance, biopower, polyisocyanurate, closed cell, 
medium density, hydro fluoro carbon. Ken Campbell gave the front row of his solo audience, his solo performance audience in Mystery Bruises, protective gear, as he took a can of expanding foam and a six inch nail and hammered it into the can. The can exploded and Ken declaimed, instant art in his weasel like nasal vocal. Little bits of foam that have bled out of a cavity in buildings are called snots. Don't wipe the snot clean though, as the dust can be carcinogenic. Expanding foam is full of very dynamic compounds and chemicals, which means it is very, very vibrant. I found you little frog like friend on my street next to a car exhaust and you spoke to me. Put me in your collection. Don't put me in the bin. You have presents like the root, but are a man made, supposedly, like a blob in a B movie. The green tinge you wear so well makes you look sort of almost organic. Created, wrought, fabricated, constructed, made, to make, artificially produced, formed independently of natural development. Hello. So now I'm just going to shift a little bit of a mode again. We have a bit of time. Lovely. The object is an actor within the spaces of practice with more significance than just an instrumental tool or prop. I demonstrate this viewpoint of objects representing embodied significance in practice by my playful interactions with this root and with the piece of expanding foam. And I'm discussing with the root as a performing object, its unique position in relationship for me in, in relationship to ecology and art. And this is what I'm doing at the moment with my research, talking to, talking with, and talking through objects, which can seem like an, a ridiculous practice sometimes. The theory that I'm using to underpin this way of thinking about objects is um, object-oriented ontology, or triple O, as it's now become kind of popularly talked about, and new materialism. And what they give us is a sense of reconsidering the material existence of art um, with a very non-anthropocentric bias, so one of the leaders of Triple uh, O is Graham Harmon, and he considers how things do not hang together and the association between things um, and between objects involves autonomy despite the interrelations between things. For Harmon, the aesthetic object is inwardness. It, it, it is each thing as an I, everything from within itself is an I. And this is quoting from Harmon. Triple O is a study of things in themselves, involves the exploration of the executant inwardness of things. And Harmon presents the object as bundles of mysteries in an environment in which things can act as a chain of differences. His view of art is that it does not produce knowledge, but things in themselves and for that way, theatre produces directly the mystery of the artwork. Triple O draws heavily from also the ideas of a, a very famous um, um, philosopher who now thinks a lot about ecology, Bruno Latour, and his uh, theory of actor network theory. And this is a flat ontology. 
um, but that creates actors out of objects, which is where I come into this um, because I'm a puppeteer and I'm a trained puppeteer and I work and I'm making puppet theatre and I teach puppet theatre. But these objects act because they exist rather than existing because they act. And what I'm interested in these performances with the root and with the expanding foam is the inner language of the object, but talking to that and you and thinking about that as those objects still remaining, having a mystery, those absences and lacunas in their work and in the practice that I do. So these is very speculative about thinking through with objects, how we can inhabit the spaces that we are in now. Um, and through this speculative and embodied practice, I attempt the impossible navigation into the inner poetry, the imagined experience of objects. And one of the other thinkers is really, really important in this. I'm sure some people here, um, some people aware of this thinker is Jane Bennett. And I do talk about vibrancy and the idea of vibrant matter. Just checking on the time. I've got. I'm good for time. We started a few minutes late, so I, I will give an, another few minutes of just kind of concluding this section to discuss in relationship, complementary way with what we've just seen. Um, the viewpoint about the prop the propensities of objects has led me to reconsider materiality in practice. In this reconsider re reconsideration, I think about triple O. And this theory to encounter the object as a form for me as collaborator in practice, forming kind of some sets of kinship with objects. And by exploring this method, um, I set out to explain how I think the object can be thought differently about in practice, but also how that can change the way we think about art practices in, in a way, particularly in performance contexts. And perhaps the object in this context changes more than we like to assume, and not as inert things. Obviously, I've, these are very vibrant objects that I've introduced you in today, and I'm fascinated by these objects. And relating this temporal and affective experience of practice to Triple O, drawn into this viewpoint of what I've started to talk about as applied puppetry, puppetry that goes out into communities, suggests this flattening out of relationships of, of humans to things, and that's not to lessen people. Um, in my practice, that's really important that I don't do that. It's actually about raising up objects to have more significant in the space. And this horizontal relation between objects and subjects can be seen as controversial. But for me in the work that I've done, and particularly in the communities and certain communities, it's actually not about dehumanizing people or uh, you know, making them feel othered or marginalised in that way. It's about actually the objects allowing us a way to open up those kind of dialogues. Um, and the objects enable that in a very, very interesting way. Um, this positively for me, this flattening of um, the um, ontology um, has occurred in the imaginative space of practices like the one I'm showing you today. And this is why I employ performing objects to speak about experiences, um, sometimes giving them voices as I would with a puppet, but that these objects is very different relationship that I have because they don't have that sort of normal puppet form. And the intention is to give the object more significance on a higher level towards the already high status of participants and performers human performers. And that's where I think my work really speaks to what's going on in this conference. And I'm so pleased with the um, wonderful title of this conference, because I, many years ago, one of my first puppet show shows had a sentient spoon, uh, was one of the characters in that performance. And uh, I've always gone back to this kind of like this idea of, if you think about the sentience of things, uh, and particularly objects, particularly things in, our, in the natural environments um, like trees, it really starts to kind of chime with um, Tim Morton's kind of ideas about how we can be ecological. Um, and this an anti-anthropocentrism also offers us a way of thinking critically about the Anthropocene and the way we take objects and others for granted in our environments and also in our practices and our performances. Right, I'm really happy to take some questions now um i'm not sure how that works in here but i might hand over to richard 
And I'd love to talk to anybody who was here to to watch that. I wasn't sure who was there and who was watching, but we'll, I'd definitely love to have the conversation. Uh, yeah, so it's a slightly isolating experience being in, in the webinar space because you've got two audiences, but you don't have no idea who they are or, or where they are. Um, got a comment here, a question here from uh, uh, Pet Petra. Um, let me just see if I can invite Petra to come in because it's quite a, um, uh, a, a complex thing. So Petra, I believe you can now um, join us. Would you like to just articulate your comment or your question to Matt? All right, Petra, we can, uh, we, I don't know if we, if you can, we can see you on the stage. Oh, there you are. Very good. Ah, excellent. Welcome. Uh, I think you're muted at the moment. There, great. Are you still muted, though? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you very much Not for you. the talk. Really, really um, inspiring and, and um, sort of working along maybe different lines, but also um, um, working with an object is um, something that can respond or with an understanding that there is a response. So I was wondering, because you come from puppeteering uh, and presumably you are familiar with Kleist, this mm -hmm. element of um, not being self-aware and that movement that is not self-aware contains a grace. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's it's kind of one of the key uh, philosophical essays that's been ever produced about puppetry. And I think, um, I mean, recently, um, I think the philosopher's name is John Gray, is a, is a, is a British philosopher who, who, who used this to discuss human freedom. And he's written some quite controversial uh, texts called, one of them was Straw Dogs. I think it's John Gray. Uh, anyway, um, I mean, uh -huh. and this idea, what I think it's interesting is, for me, what I'm finding, the more that I research into the field of objects and puppetry is you know, for, for that essay with Kleist, it was about, te it was a dancer and a philosopher looking at puppets to understand what grace is in movement. And I think what I love about objects is they have this grace, but also they are great tools for learning for human beings. And, and once we, once we allow ourselves to really concentrate um, in a really, really intense way, on those things, particularly like for me with the root, it's like if I spend time looking at a root, it teaches me how ridiculous my need is to turn that into a face, a human face, that root, and to anthropomorphize it. So it kind of teaches me about, in a sense, all the things that we're we're fighting with at the moment, which is this way that we're locked into the the, the the problem of like well how do we think differently how do we kind of like move beyond our very you know the anthropocene in a sense in a sense so I think yeah the the Kleist essay is brilliant because yeah that you know grace appearing more uh, more in an unconscious thing than a than a conscious thing is a is an sort of impossible thing to attain as performers but it is still I think in the history of all performance it's still there as a something that people want to attain because um i guess in that sense there's a kind of there is a purity in it but also i think more now it's about that question of like what does that say to us about what we think freedom is um which is even you know uh, mm. a, 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 a much bigger sort of thing but but yeah that's uh, thank you so much for the feedback because right? it's um it, it, it's lovely to it's lovely to have these kind of like um these conversations online and i've i've done this a few times this performance and now i kind of like i present it as a video as well sometimes but the new thing today was this piece of expanding foam because also i want to trouble the idea of that we're always kind of valorizing or giving so much so much weight to natural objects in this kind of sort of sometimes a little bit you know they're they're they're, they're more important than this object and i think actually this object says quite a bit more sometimes than looking just at a natural route because we just we go back to romantic ideas about landscapes and 
natural beauty and things like that. And I think um, I think that's beautiful as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Ultimately, it's it's also natural. It comes from carbon. I mean, it's you can yeah. you know if you, it depends yeah. how far yeah. back you go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And those There's and those another, words. Another... Yes. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. And those words are beautiful as well. You know that I I'm, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know what those words are. You know, I don't know those things, but that that one thing is is producing that poetry because of its you know like you say it's, it's got it's, it's, because it comes back to carbons or just that kind of you know reading the object in that in, in that way for me is is always uh, um enriching it's always a great thing yeah i think we've got an uh Matt, we do have a yeah we do have a one. you see that there in the chat um yeah. Or do I need to read that question? To yeah, you? no, it's fine. I can look at it. Yeah, I think that I think there is a lot. Um, thank you. I don't think there's anything necessarily. It's about. It's quite a difficult question. It's a good question. It's a great one. It's going to make me think a bit. It's great. Um, I think this thing of like, um, there's nothing. There, anthropomorphism. I, I'm not critiquing anthropomorphism. I think there's nothing wrong because I actually do it as a practice as well. I mean, I think as a puppeteer, I I will pick up, you know, I will pick up a spoon and it will become a character. So I'm guilty of that. And I think in some ways in my practice, I'm troubling that or kind of questioning what I'm doing there. I think playing with that is one thing about it. Um, and I do think, that, you know, there are definitely... Um, there are definitely issues around kind of like the object orientated ontology uh, philosophy um, as there is with a lot of kind of new, new philosophies coming out of that. I'm not aware of the the criticisms of, um, well, I'm aware of some criticisms of, of new materialism, but that one I'm kind of not, not aware of, but that sounds really interesting. Um, Oh, the sound. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the sound. Apologies, I didn't really explain. I'm not really explained what that is. It is a... Actually, Matt, before you do that, I'm just going to read the question because yeah. not, not necessarily everyone can see it. So, um, yeah. so, so I love the I love the presentation. Thank you. I wondered if you have introduced the root to the foam. Have they conversed? What would that be like? Also, how many objects have you got in your archive? Loads of questions here. Do you think this presentation with a selection of, uh, do you do this presentation with a selection of other objects? Thank you. I'm the co-director of the Centre for Material Thinking at Aberystwyth. Oh, brilliant. That's lovely. That's so, that's so, so lovely to see. Yes, definitely have to have a conversation. That's brilliant. Um, I'll just explain a little bit of the technical stuff because I, I'm not sure how clear it was on the on coming across Zoom. It is very, very basic tech. So this is a, a looper pedal, um, and the looper pedal picks up the clicks and the kind of the the the, the sound that's coming just from the movement of the, the root. Um, and that in itself is what it kind of gives the, the a, some sort of strange voice to the object. If you think about it, it kind of you know. It, there's lots of there's lots of ways of thinking it doesn't, but this is a simple looper pedal, um, and then that is I I really like because it kind of makes the sound very the materiality the sound very obvious. This silly little Marshall stack that's kind of like a toy really. So that's where that, <laughs> that's where that sound comes from. So it's kind of um, for me those bits it's all about i love showing the materiality of the of the practice very obviously sometimes audiences and this is where i'm going on that but yeah i mean there's loads that you said in it and i'm really really loving what you um uh, uh i think the text from kleist is just called on the marionette theater um and it is great it's very short it's from uh, early 19th century i think something like 1810 um um got got another question i'm just going to read into the session it says it's come in from the floor do you have different visceral sensations with different objects do you feel their animacy differently depending on what the object is um um it's uh, the there's a one just before that i think it's john gray and the book is um 
Oh, I think it might be called the freedom of the marionette, but I'm not not exactly sure. But anyway, the thing of the um, the visceral sensations, it's kind of interesting because I think what I'm doing is is I'm slightly allowing myself not to not to lose myself too much in the object. I think from my training, there is a sense of one of the things that you, you're very conscious of from puppetry training is the weight of objects. And the, in, and this is something that actually Kleist talks about in terms of dancers, is that when a, a puppet has a different center of balance, and that is a very simple thing, and puppeteers learn that very quickly in their training, so you kind of understand the weight of the object. And that kind of is one way that I feel it viscerally. Um, and the kind of loop between me and the object, I like to kind of, when I perform in front of a live audience, I want to be really, really present in that. Um, and that's what that's all about, really. It's about presenting in, it, it, presenting the kind of mechanics of what I do and not hiding what I'm doing. And I think that's where I guess you get a sense of my my visceral experience but often i think the one thing that's happening there as well which might not might not really answer that question but is it almost like a sense of care for the object which is like one puppeteer famously said and it sounds a bit patronizing to the object but said that the, the the puppeteer is like a nursemaid for the for the object sometimes and i like that kind of phrase because it feels like you're kind of you're caring for that thing. And that in itself just brings something new to those visceral experiences. Um, great. Matt, Matt, thank you ever so much. That was a really interesting presentation. I thank think you. you need to move on. Absolutely. Um, but uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that. And lots of good uh, questions and interaction. So thank you very much indeed. Um, very much a work in progress. It's kind of coming from my art practice, but it is also grounded in my PhD research. Um, and this particular piece I've been making with um, a new artist called Lou Bennett. Pardon him again. So my plan is to basically give you a, a bit of context as to what this project is about and um, I'd like to invite you to do a short embodied practice with me and then I'll share the film which is five minutes long. Um, so we should have lots of time for conversation or questions if they come. Um, and yeah, I would really welcome any sense of how it lands with you actually because it's really a work in progress <laughs> um yeah so the conversation will be very interesting for me. um so in terms of context i'm really interested in the practice of archaeology as something that sits in quite a troublesome place um because on the one hand it is uh, the whole discipline is extremely Colonial is founded in colonialism and um, looting, and those are its origins. It's an extremely extractive practice from, from one point of view. Um, and it tends to, it has a tendency to offer other past and other materials and other that which lies below the ground, basically. Um, on the other hand, it's it's about wonder and it's about enchantment and um, it's a very tender practice if you see it from another point of view because actually the whole purpose of archaeology as it's understood now is to take care it's caretaking knowledge and wisdom from the past four future generations so I really see it as having this dance and I experience it as having this dance between kind of violence on one side and tenderness on the other side. And I'm interested in staying with that trouble, you know, in the, in the line of Haraway, really staying there and seeing what can come from that. Um, so for this piece, I was interested in what it would be like to, to really consciously dig a hole. Um, we, Tallulah and I spent time considering 
We spent a lot of time considering the act of what it means to go through the ground surface um, and what, what systems and actions and hierarchies enable us to do that. We were really trying to look at that moment of piercing and penetrating um, the ground and what that was like for us, what that felt like, what it made us think about. Um, I also just wanted to pick up on, um, Laura Cooper gave a really beautiful presentation yesterday about um, equine system learning. And she talked about how certain spaces have the capacity to amplify gestures. And I'm really interested in the, um, the process of digging in an archaeological way as amplifying a, a kind of focusing and narrowing of attention um, that comes with depth. And also with that, focusing and narrowing of the body. The body becomes very compacted. There's a lot of kneeling on the ground, being very small, very small hand movements, occasionally a bigger one. But it's all about soreness and pressure and hips and knees and feeling very, very creaky after a day in the field. So um, there's a sense of that kind of increasing density the, the deeper you get. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, really what I'm presenting here is, is like my first steps um, towards creatively up trying to articulate some of this stuff. Um, so I wanted to invite you to share with me a short practice. It's, it's an adaptation of the practice that Tallulah has shared with me. Um, as I understand it, it's to do with the, the embodied relationship between proximity, knowing the body's place, and proximity and the dopamine system. Tallulah's nodding, so I'm hoping I <laughs> describe that okay. So you can stay sitting, or you might want to stand up. It's completely up to you. Um, I'm quite sure. So to begin with, if you close your eyes, I'm going to stay here for five breaths. Just taking a moment to feel what your body feels like and where its edges are. And I'd invite you to bring the palms of your hands quite close to your eyes so that when you open your eyes now, you're looking into the palms of your hands. And you're going to look at them for five breaths. And then closing your eyes again. Noticing how you feel with your body. For about five breaths. When it's time, you can open your eyes and try to seek with your eyes the furthest point you can see.
perhaps noticing the difference between the closeness of your hands. At this point, you can see. Closing your eyes again. Turning into the body. When you feel ready, about five breaths, I'd like you to open your eyes, orientated to the ground. So it might be that you just tilt your head down. Might be that you want to bend down or kneel down. It might be that you want to touch the ground. If you're interested in being physically close to the ground, see how close you can get. What is this surface? I wonder whether it's solid or whether it's permeable. It looks like there are some tiny spaces between the walls. I wonder how thick it is. Where does it begin? Do you know what's below it? Are you interested in what's below it? How do you have thought about that? Does it matter? What might it be like to know all of the layers that are below this surface? What's it like to feel yourself orientated in this direction? What's it like to move away from it? To create more distance. Uh, 
perhaps becoming more aware again of the edges of this space, that we are in a space, or maybe still with the floor. Archaeologists are always trying to get closer. Well, they just look to have holes in big holes, but the holes in big things.
and searching. I'm listening for the stories, really. The ground does share a story, curiosity. With those who listen, I'm listening for the stories, really. I find it's totally fascinating. I'm not quite sure if I've got the right words to ask the questions that seem to arise up and ready to have that we can allow that to settle a bit more. But I find it really interesting how um you made us think of uh, experience the ground, but in here it's, the ground is just a it's just a surface. It's just a film or a thin thing. But when you show us the ground in the video, it's a substance that you can't really touch properly. And I found it such a, a fantastic contrast between how the experience of the ground is the soil, but the soil comes apart, it doesn't stay together. So that happens on your skin, on your hands. But on the other hand, your body is that entity, whereas the ground is not. It's just coming apart, it's crumbly, it sticks very thinly to your fingers. And mm -hmm. um, I, I found that the, the different <clears throat> embodied units that presented themselves there and our communication. Mm -hmm. I found really interesting that I seem I seem to not quite have the language to express that. Mm -hmm. I think I know what you mean. It's, <coughs> it's interesting. So the soil um, in the film, which is really grainy, is soil which has been um, troweled, like so it's come very fine through the troweling which is one very particular like material quality of the soil. Um, actually, it was, it was like 100% clay, so it was really difficult to dig. And it's not in this, but I have a lot of footage of me pushing against it, and it did feel quite like a big contrast, like very solid and bodily and immovable, heavy. And I think that is something that I find really interesting about soil is its ability to trans transfer into those different different qualities. I am an official artist, and I um, in, in my practice I have an outdoor arts practice where I where I work on the ground, and, but I don't go into it. I find it quite interesting that the ground seems to be uh, like an interface where you reflect yourself towards and reflect to yourself back. Um, but you don't, I don't go into it. What you have shown there is something else where the ground has an interface from uh, against which I bounce and give, that gives me something that, that comes apart and dissolves itself as, an, as, a, as a sentient entity that I respond to. And yeah, it crumbles and all of a sudden it's the, the ground is three dimensional in the, how it presents to the experience like you were sitting in this hole. Yeah. And so for me, it's quite a really, really interesting new experience because I think I'm very, very ground-centered in, 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 in the way how I relate to the outdoors as well. But I've not experienced it like that. Interesting. Um, I think archaeology gives you a really particular vision or, or a sense of what it is that you're walking on or relating with because 
Um, the way that archaeology is recorded in kind of code is it's all in layers. So where, whatever layer you're working on, um, there's always more layers beneath it until you hit the natural, is what it's called. And then there's something that hasn't been kind of mediated over time. Or I guess there must be some arbitrary point in time that archaeology is like that. As a geology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. It's just yeah. not human mediation, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. In the making of the film, we also got quite interested in where that surface even starts, because all of the all of the kind of like, okay, what do we need in place in order to do this? It start the surface sort of started in a temporal way before we even met the field, and we did a lot of walking around and meeting the space and working out where to be, and then also once we started digging, it's like the surface was really thick. And it kept going, and I, I felt like I was always dealing with the surface. Really. I found it very interesting what you said when you, um, when we dig down, it makes it very tight in yourself, even because you're you're in mobile for a longer amount of time. And uh, I find that quite interesting, but also the the, the general idea of is there something really metaphorical about digging into the ground and getting the response, what it feels like in your own body. And are we, in, are we digging into our own embodied substance? If, if our body is a sentient sculpture, what I would say sometimes in, in the visual arts context, are we, can, we can we excavate there or is excavation, like you describe it, as it resonates something that's got to do with own history? Own sentient or embodied history. Maybe that's a bit far fetched, but maybe a good question to ask. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to have a think about that. There's definitely something for me, even though my body becomes more constricted, there's a real expansiveness at depth when working with archaeological materials for me because it opens up my imaginal realm. Mm. And yeah, I guess a sense of personal history because I'm. Does anyone else have a question? We have another space for two minutes. I just want to say that I'm interested to look at the other video as well. And I really like, there's lots of things I like about it, but one of them is that the contradiction of the violence and the tenderness. It's just something which really. And holding those sort of things that are contradictory. Yeah, so I think that's something I'd really like to experiment with going forward because I've got a lot of footage that um, is more aggressive. I feel like I've probably got enough for like infinite films, basically. He's structured with make films when you're not No, but it's my first. first I really enjoyed the young questions about the electoral networks. So, like, I don't know, I don't know, but also, the other part of my life is digging a lot of holes for the environment to try to dig trees and stuff. There's something really like beautiful about doing it, but also, to me, it's always quite aggressive, but it was also so, yeah, into the ground and that. Juxtaposition is like an interesting thing. Yeah. Anyway, so I was really like loving this one. Yeah, and that as well. It's such a really inspiring thing to work with. But then there's also like the beauty as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, totally coexist. There's something I always found as well about like, when you're digging a hole, it's actually really hard to refill. Like, no, we'll make it. We'll put it back. <laughs> and somehow the soil becomes a loose and just kind of disappears. And... Yeah, you're great. 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 Yeah, you
Yeah, it's true. It's it was a weird experience for the inner trying to put the turf back on top. <laughs> like, oh, we've <laughs> really done something here. Yeah. Alice, um, there's something coming from Matt, who was the previous okay. um, speaker. He just thanks for the lovely session. It reminded me of uh, Bruno Le Saw and his discussion on, on of how we inhabit a thin layer of earth. This seems really connected to your great practice. Mm. He sent a link, so that's uh, a live link which you can check check later, no doubt, or pass it on to you. Awesome. Okay, thanks, Matt. I just, I just wanted to say, um, this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> That's what she wanted to say. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Welcome to uh, the next session from uh, Marina uh, Gutzer. Uh, she is joining us from Brazil, where it's a, a rather ghastly time of the day. So and Marina's been waiting backstage for an hour to come on. Uh, but we're really pleased to have you with us, Marina. And we're really looking forward to your uh, presentation. So I will uh, now leave the stage and um, over to you. And when you're ready to share your screen, just do it as you normally would, and we will be able to see it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I will try to share my screen. Can you see it? I can't hear anyone or see anyone. So if someone can just please say, say to me. Yeah, uh, yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, so Here's, uh, I would like to thank you. The, the, it's such a, a wonderful experience to be here. I'm talking to Brazil, from Brazil. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's really early, so uh, I apologize for my English because sometimes I may uh, mixture <laughs> also the languages. And this is what I'm going to present now. It's a research, a theor theoretical and uh, practical research I've been doing with women here in Brazil. I'm from the Federal University of Sao Paulo, which is based uh, in the port area of the city of Santos, which is the biggest port in South America. So it's a very uh, conflictual uh, city uh, based on all colonialism and um, destruction from nature. So it's it's a very interesting city based on the when we see when we look through the lens of Anthropocene. So I'm a researcher and artist at Lab Lab Corpi Arte with Body and Art. And we I have the partnership with Instituto Pro Comum with a, it's a, a civil organization from the society and we work in the, the Porto port port area of Santos. So this uh, this project uh, is based on the effective al alliances between women and plants. So it's 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 built as a a workshop uh, that proposes an assembly game with elements that you have at hand. It was made first to be done with women that I worked before in this territory during the pandemic time. So. I thought about this game I could do with them online, but now we are doing in presence, and uh, it's it's a it's it, it intends to forge a ritual between women and plants, and uh, just to to tell you, these women are not artists or dancer or anything. They are w workers. They are women that take care of many kids or houses or they work and take care of everybody as many women have this multiple uh, functions in our society in our patriarchal society so this workshops intends to 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 bring them together and forge this ritual between women and plants and also think about uh, this choreography of mixture 
uh, playing with words with uh, Emanuele Cocha. Uh, he suggests in the, the book, The Life of Plants, that we live for mixed mixing with other people's life and other things' life. So he brings the philosophy or this metaphysics of plants as uh, these bodies that are together with the environment. So uh, these workshops intends to make uh, alternative ways of re relating to this territory, which is so devastated by the port uh, and the uh, in, activity of men so it is really strange to say that but we have so many plants here in brazil but in the poor areas of the people the plants are really rare you don't have you don't see trees or you don't see uh gardens or uh, public spaces with the green areas so the more uh, developed the city is here, the more we have lack of trees and green area to, to be, bring people together and to stay like cooler in the heart of the city. So it is also a way of connecting uh, women back to plants and also in understanding that the, is here also in our culture that women women uh, save or they keep the secrets from plants, like how plants can take care of us and how, which plants we use in our body when you need to, to, to heal something, which tea you, you drink and which bath you take and which plants, like the secrets of caring or taking care of us in our body are really related to plants. And these secrets are, uh, with women so uh, this choreographic it's, it's like this game with with uh, looking at finding these al alliances with the plants of your territory or with the plants of your history or personal history so you, it can be stem roots sap leaves flower fruits many kinds of pieces of plants and many ways that plants come together with our body and propose uh, different small dances for us. So the choreographic uh, workshop, uh, it's between this meeting between women and plant. So I also propose that women get to know uh, the plants of their territory, but also they bring together with the, this alliances um, uh, this clothes and objects they stay at they 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 stay no uh, they they are at, at our our home and we don't use anymore because during the pandemic time there were no possibility to go out or there there were no parties going on so all these clothes they are like uh, in our how do you say that uh, where you put clothes in and. Uh, so as we live in the seaside, all this, this thing that I keep kept, uh, in, in boxes or in, I, I'm, I'm not remembering the word of where you, where you put your clothes on when you, you have your house and you have this cabinets. I don't know. Everything that is put in a place here in the seaside, it gets really humid and smell bad so it was also this uh, movement for women to bring in these clothes off so this party clothes and this colorful clothes that we use to to be happy and to play and to dance so i put together this clothes this women everybody brings things together and we will like mix and uh, transform ourselves and like in a very funny and playful way to to be other and to uh, imagine other bodies and possibilities of life and and make rituals together with this counter domestications of the women body uh, 
So I also use this philosophy that we have right now a really important voice, indigenous voice here in Brazil. His name is Ayuton Krenaki. I don't know if you heard of him, but if you don't, please take a look at what he's saying about the end of the world. He's an, a very uh, important person for this moment now. And he's, he, he talked uh, in, a, in a very, in a 2016 Biennale of Sao Paulo, which is a very important art event of Brazil. He gave an interview and talked about these affective alliances and uh, uh, understanding that we are not only allied with uh, politics or social or uh, economical uh, processes, but the alliances are also things that are we, we connect with plants, we connect with the rivers, uh, we connect with with the tides. So. It, it's very beautiful, this uh, interview, and I, I, I really like this idea that we have to bring together affective alliances so we could uh, go through this moment uh, with more friends, <laughs> or uh, how Donna Howard says, I don't know the word for in English, but it's kind of, kind, kind, you, you know the text of Donna Howard, she says that we are together with like family, but it's not family, it's friends and family together. So the format of uh, like the, this workshops were done online or in person, as I told you, and the meeting was around 20 women that interested in participating. Uh, artists and no artists would, were bring together. So it was really fun to, to work with all kinds of women uh, all of all ages, and uh, we we made this this figures, and so I use the life of plants of Emanuele Cocha and this really idea that living is nothing more than mixing with the lives of others. And uh, the, here is this interview with an Ayuton Krenaki that I told you. Uh, so he, he's talking here about this experimentation of making alliances with what is not human. So when you go to a river, for example, when you, you get into the water, you, you have these alliances with the water. And that makes the life, uh, you, you open up for an, another important uh, version of understanding that we are really together with other, other beings and other uh, things as Matt also told us in, in the beginning. So uh, the other idea that I used for this research is the power of the Arctic from Other Lord, which is a, a very important uh, feminist uh, poetry and activist. In, and she, she has this really good text about telling us how we lost as women this this power that we have of living an erotic life because uh, the erotism was connected by men with sexuality. And, and she, tells, uh, she, tell, she talks about how is, uh, there are many kinds of problem, uh, powers and the erotic is a resource within each of us lies in deeply female and spiritualized plan firmly rooted in the power of our unexpressed or unrecognized feeling. Uh, so it's also when you look at plants, especially plants that are not in your house, plants that you see in the streets, and, and this exercise connects us also with us. This, like, uh, this erotic relation with plants and how they can... Uh, be power for our uh, uh, connection with with this aesthetics of life because uh, it is as I told you sometimes uh, the territories are really ugly and poor and how can we bring together also as a knowledge of indigenous and native people from Brazil but all over the world to to bring together things that put us beautifully and powerfully in front of each other and, and, and make it uh, another way of, of information of imagination of life. So 
it's it's about this sense of satisfaction and completion um, and it's something that we've been losing and losing again and again for now capitalist now liberal capitalism and uh, this individual and alone this loneliness life we live in our computers and our, in our zoom screens so it's also about that so uh it's uh, also thinking about this erotic relation that we have with plants uh in our body really much more uh beyond politics and and all that is connected with it, but also physiologically, we are really connected with what the activities the trees are doing and trees and all the plants with the air that we breathe. And also thinking about our external respiration and how uh, we are connected to, to our lungs are connected to leaves and how the oxygens and the, this, our cells are really, really erotic and tangled with, uh, with what the plants are doing. So it's really about thinking how this exercise can uh, expand the possibility of our skin uh, for, for knowing and being consciousness, not only politically, but also physiologically that we are connected with, with the plants. So like we have to take care of them too. And so this is a, uh, an, a one of the, the women that participate. Her name is Nalva. She's uh, HIV positive and she's uh, really, uh, she was an ex uh, drug uh, user and she lives w w in a very poor area of, of the city and she comes to dance with us and she really thinks dance it's important for her life and she like collected this this plants in the way for coming to the to the workshop and she brought these clothes and she she made this figure so that, that, that that's it it's in the end of the process so we we had this photographer to make this uh images and then this is Julia, and she also took this this plants that were cut in front of her house. And this is another friend, two friends that came together and make this uh, mixture together. And we suggest they kissed because they were so just like a, a little bit Marguerite. Uh, in this is all the women that participate in the first session we made in Santos. And as you see, oh, they bring, they brought their, their plants, their clothes, and they mixed together. And also then we made this, this little and ephemeral performances together. And it was so much, uh, it was very special. And then there's this video dance that we made from this experience that's also in this program from the seminar. I don't know exactly the day that they are showing it, but if you can look uh, uh, for it and it's, uh, I think it's available for the participants. Uh, and uh, more images for you. This is in another city that I made with other people from Araraquara, which is another city more from, uh, from a little bit far away from Sao Paulo. Uh, and so the plants, as you can see, the plants change because the territories change. So the clothes change and because we are all different, but we are like, uh, it, it seems that we are all connected to this relation in, uh, you know, somehow. And this is the place, the cultural center I made the first workshop with women and then we we like printed the photos and put in the the opening of the, the street as you can see the streets are, are really i don't have a better picture here but the streets are really uh, messed up because it's not a beautiful area but uh it was like we we put all this figure after the performance after the workshop finished like it stayed there for another three months in the walls and it showed for people who was passing through the streets that something 
happened there and that, that these figures oh, exist somehow in this in this place that it, it's so devastated but somehow it could also be uh, colorful and happy and also we can dance around uh, more images I think uh, also, this is a, a, another Brazilian artist that is called Wira. It's the drag queen of the forest. So it's also a reference from my work. It's, uh, uh, but I think now, uh, I don't know how I'm from time. I'll just finish my reflection here. Uh, some have references of uh, I use from cultural and um because this is this is no nothing new about putting plants in our bodies and making uh, this this kind of of ritual so i use this references from cultural pop popular from africa um, from brazil and from indigenous people but also used as uh, to adorn uh, heads and bodies and it's a beautiful work that's been done for for ages, and we we always been doing that in different ways. So, uh, also the the rituals from Brazilian and Africa religious people, which they use a lot of objects from nature to to turn the rituals into a powerful connection with it, because. All the godness and gods, the orishas are connected to some, somehow to to some element of the nature. So, uh, the separation about uh, that modern society made, and, and that's I will try to to show the images so I can come back to the text and finish my reflection here with some more organized um, arguments. And so here's the research I've been doing also with this exercise of going outside, taking plants from the streets. All these this plants were falling or uh, in the streets. So I came back and I did it for a long time during the pandemics. And, and then I could share that exercise with, with other women. And also I connected with other friends and women that were not uh, uh, doing uh, uh, artistic work in this time. And they also experimented the mixture. And here are some of the students uh, that this, this was during the pandemic time. So they, they were different. They have different quality because people made it in, in their own homes uh, when we were apart. So each one made with the plants. And that, there was this rule that we, we could not, uh, we could not use, uh, like we, we could try, we should try to use uh, plants that are already on the streets, like already dead, already falling down or already dried up. Uh, so some other exercises. Um, and I think that's uh, the idea also that I wanted to bring it. What new choreographies can we, we improvise with plants? Does looking at plants help us to intuit these relationships of imagining other worlds? And if choreogra choreography were also thought of as a known human action, what other movements would life evoke on us? Can smaller movements be thought as a big transformations, skin, sense, pause, and belonging? What if dancing is a way of approaching other possible words? Everything that moves dances in some sense. So birds, plants, larves, water, clouds, moon, tides, fish, the connection of nature's choreographies within our dancing bodies, even confined, can be ways of choreographing. So choreographing is much more than the art of conceiving the movement and steps 
to compose a certain dance as it is in the Oxford Dictionary, or describing dances on paper and highlighted by the researcher André Lepecki when resuming the history of this word, this word, which is the first version in a dance manual from uh, one, uh, the century 16, suggesting that it, it is an apparatus of bureaucratic state capture of dance. Above all, an apparatus is created that is disciplined, disciplining and organizing not only movements, but bodies and subjectivities. So during the modern turns, many artistic movements exploded these notions of choreography, creating other contexts and inventing the ways of relating in different spaces into the body and uh, proposing uh, uh, also other spaces that we could dance, like the cities and imagining and exploding the idea of representation in order to perform. Uh, in, the, in these works, I intend to look at plans to think about this possibility and also these in, invisible choreographies and unthought places such as those this woman performed, improvising and mixing, experimenting with choreography with plans. This is no new from the native and cosmologic people. Although it seems new for Western and thought and philosophy, like so many we've heard today, uh, we have made the separation between culture, natural body, and care. This was not done for the native people that live, here, especially here in Brazil. As we can see in countless works of modern anthropologies that has been pu published now as this thinker Ailton Krenak, I told you before, and, and above all, the work The Fall from the Sky from David Kopenhauer and Bruce Albert that was published in 2010. I don't know if this is published in UK, but maybe yes. Many of this illness that we have now that these people call shawara, that is, is this experience of separation and is today that reflects this exploitation and destruction of the ecosystem that shelter us. What was once described as savage today appears as a way to relearn and to mix and to dance with other livings as a way of salvation. And just to finish that, uh, we have to think about also the diversity and the possibility of choreographic organization uh, that teaches us how to make a forest in these times of monoculture and destruction. It may, it may be necessary to flee from some already existing protocols, from already no movements, from gestures already useless in the face of the forms of oppression and to go to improvisations of life and imaginary, imaginary that is not, I'm sorry, that's not done, that's not given away. Just a minute, I was here. In, in, including human and new human agents in a network of materialities and sensibilities that promote plural and specific choreographic, not always consensual. It is the production of landscapes, which is not only catalogued by diversity, but managed to narrate the stories in which diversities emerge, and understanding that diversity is always created with collaborative synergies, always a become. And just to finish that all this sensitive and sentient experience, it's a way of responding to the most and important uh, ways of of destruction, which is racist colonialism and uh, neo liberation capitalism. Uh, I think I finish here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina. Um, would you like to unshare your screen and then we can see ourselves on the
There we go. That was a, 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 a gorgeous, absolutely wonderful presentation. The imagery is so powerful. They, 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 uh, the, the women in those images become become something else. It becomes something quite extraordinary. And I, uh, I just wondered about the decision to cover the face and, and what, what, where that where that decision came from. Well, the decision, it also came from these references of the um, ancient use of masks that sure. provide, get away our identity and mix us together with also that something is bigger than us. And it's not about me, Marina, or the Nauva, the women that I show you. It's about any women in the world. So uh, it's about taking away the identity of us and bringing us together. Okay, I'm just just trying. I'm just going to ask now if there are any questions on the floor in the studio. We are quite tight on time now, so we'll probably have to uh, finish in a minute. Uh, I don't see any immediate questions. There is a comment here from uh, from Matt who says. Uh, she's very beautiful and powerful images of a fantastic community project. The plants seem to choreograph the human. The stillness of the people in the images with the plants makes them very effective. I like this scholar very much. Arboreal feminisms in the Anthropocene, which is by Katrina, uh, Professor Katrina Sandlands, Sandlands from York in Canada. And there's lots of uh, uh, applause coming in from the floor. Uh, and I think it um, is probably time to, to wrap up the session. But I think everyone was really enjoying the images. And uh, I hope we will revisit some of them and be able to put some of them up on our website as well. Uh, thank you for being with us at this uh, a difficult hour for you. Uh, we really appreciate it very much. Uh, it's been lovely Thank to you. have you, and your contribution is very, very powerful and very beautiful. So thank you for joining us. Thank and you. Thank, thank you for everyone. We will be back uh, in this space in about 25 minutes. Okay, bye-bye for now.